Duncan, WordPress.com, Troubles in Paradise Project. Hi, I'm James Downard, and we are here for another episode of Evolution Hour, and I would like to thank again SciStrike for his inimitable help on Zooming uh, us into reality in here, and he will be a silent partner. Uh, Jackson Wheat um, is, as usual, working on, the, on Wednesdays, but he may be able to squeak in later on. We'll find out. Uh, at any rate, uh, I give him always the nod. Uh, we had a delicious conversation with an origins of life researcher that unfortunately was not available for public viewing and uh, uh, nevertheless someday we may be able to discuss more about that but uh, topic main topic number one is the continuing one where um, I am in investigating at the source level to show you how source methods works in the grungy grimy world of how you fact check crap uh, and even non-crap. These apply just as much to regular science papers as to creationism. Uh, Contested Bones was written by two creationists in 2017, and they're arguing evolution bad, human evolution really bad, and they scavenge around through the science literature. Very rarely do they ever cite any actual creationist source. Uh, there's only about three or four of them that they've managed to pull out so far out of like 400, so almost all of it is citing the regular source material, and you think, oh, that makes a really solid case. Not if you start looking at the source material. And that's where source methods comes in. So their current chapter is trying to undermine radioactive dating. And basically they've been reprising much of the same stuff that they've been repeating earlier. One of them that particularly caught my eye that I had covered in a bit, way earlier in this series, uh, the New Mexico Geochronology Research Laboratory, uh, where they had put up a reference to um, uh, potassium argon dating methods and they quote mined it and they quote mined it again here with a convenient little dot 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 in it. Uh, the problem is that they were leaving out all of what they were explaining why the argon argon method worked better and why it was more reliable. So they were suppressing information and then, then they suppressed it again. So they get double uh, points for uh, uh, data suppression. Um, I'm uh, looking over there. Oh, hi, Heat Shield and Brian. I'm getting kind of a side feed on the um, comment section and so sometimes it falls into blurriness and sometimes it doesn't and oh I, I should actually make sure I'm, I didn't put my link out there for um, my um, oh, yep, yep. I probably should have done that a little bit earlier let's get over to there and let's uh, put on on that uh, that way I can follow the uh, the linkage as well anyway um, there were several papers that I put direct linkages to that are there to give you some idea about what's going wrong with Rupi and Sanford and why they're misunderstanding the material. And uh, some refer to these crystallization factors. One of the things that really struck me was uh, a paper that they had cited on um, um, argon composition of metamorphic fluids, uh, implications for geochronology and others, uh, that when I started, whoop, uh, let me grab my papers. Um, that when they actually started to look through the pieces and find out what was going on, they included one by this uh, Masahiko Honda, uh, which is not the car company. And it was on noble gases in submarine pillow basalt. And uh, they were citing it as if it were about radiometric dating. Tiny problem, it isn't. <laughs> you haven't even discussed radiometric issues. And so what I suspect is that what they were doing was uh, glomming onto some technical sources, maybe in a creationist paper, and forgetting to um, actually check to see whether it was referring to what they were supposed to. So I also put another paper up um, that Honda had co-written um, with another scientist uh, that was from quite a few years later. That puts a little bit more into perspective about neon and other usages. See, all of this stuff, um, radioactive processes are entering, uh, producing radioactive material and also uh, decay products. And what the last 30 or 40 years has been is to figure out what implication that has, not only for what happens to all these little noble gases, which don't form chemical bonds and therefore they just blop around. If you have something with an with a inert gas in it and it heats up, well, it's a gas, so it can bubble out and they have to think that. The other factor is that there's affinities for certain kinds of crystal forms and those forms under certain temperatures and all that. So instead of just seeing this is a problem for radiometric dating, it's clues to what's going on inside the earth. 
So they're able to see these rocks and particular crystal forms that have a particular tendency to retain or lose these gases. And that's giving clues as to what's going on deep in the earth. That's what these later papers uh, that I put up are about. And uh, for some weird reason, the creationists don't want to bring that information up. Uh, and the idea that all of this can be happening functionally only a few thousand years old uh, is just twaddle, but they don't connect up the dots in terms of their own frame. Uh, let me let's say hi to some people in the live chat. Lisa for truth, hi. And um, uh, Brian Stevens and uh, Yanya and uh, TD Lane, I've seen you on uh, Twitter and that as well. Uh, uh, quite a few of us have been um, having interactions with an assortment of creationists on Twitter where um, we endeavor to in, uh, defend true science and sound reasoning. And there are an ample supply of twaddleists out there. Typically, these are, are not um, higher level people in the creationism movement. Um, the, the, the Andrew Snellings and that bunch don't really tweet. Uh, they're not involved in that. They don't even necessarily lecture a hell of a lot. What you get on social media are the lower echelon bottom feeders who have seen videos or read an article somewhere that says what they want to be true, and now they're experts, and then they throw this stuff out. And some of them don't even get to that expert level. It's, it could be quite hilarious. Um, T.D. Lane says, uh, thank you. You find uh, RJ's work to be interesting and very functional for dealing with stupid. Well, I'm, I'm trying to apply that dreaded source methods approach. Um, you'll notice that on Twitter, I'll be constantly asking for what sources you have. Ooh, that's an interesting claim. Where did you get it from? Did you fact check it? Please give us sources. I will give sources, ask me, I will provide information on there, and I do. Uh, and uh, uh, the fun thing about these creationists is that there's a double standard. They'll demand sources, and then when you give it to them, they don't pay any attention to them. They'll just say, oh, that's more of that bad science that the scientists who do the actual science do. Uh, based on what? Uh, the, uh, uh, one of them that we're dealing with is, is a fellow that goes by the name of, um, uh, oh, uh, the Rock Whisperer is his main tag, but it's actually hacking. I think hacking two is the thing. And he's had the same core thing, but he's had different screen names over the time. And uh, uh, that uh, hacking's lack of understanding of Snowball Earth is dreadful. Uh, hacking's lack of understanding on everything is dreadful. He's, he's a, 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 a renaissance man of stupid. Uh, there's only a few people online that I've found are so consistently arrogant and repetitive and don't even read their own material. I mean, somebody who honestly repeats creationist literature, but at least tries to defend it is one thing, but he doesn't even get that far. And Lisa says, Bill Ludlow has found a, a young earth creationist that sounds halfway intelligent. There are a, a, a smattering of those. Uh, I think you probably find um, Kurt Wise and Todd Wood and uh, that branch um, quite lucid and in, in their own ways careful-ish. But remember, if you've got somebody that has a non-negotiable dogma that they're trying to give up, um, they eventually are going to bump into the speed bumps that don't fit their model. And one of the things that really uh, I, uh, I treat as one of the litmus tests is um, interbedded airborne volcanic ash. That's the holy grail of material because uh, if you think about it, the flood covers all the earth, fine, and it sloshes and lays down stuff uber fast, and fine, and it drowns all the critters, okay, and then it turns into rock really fast. Uh, that's kind of a question mark part. And then there's all of this airborne ash. How do you get airborne volcanic ash if all the mountains are underwater? You get pillow lava. You can get, uh, there can be volcanic ash that slides down into water or is spurted out um, uh, and uh, consolidated, but it looks different when it's done underwater than it does in the airborne context. Uh, airborne ash that settles on a lake and settles down has a different kind of characteristic to it. And that's how they can tell. And so what did the spigot turn on and off like a lawn sprinkler uh, during the flood uh, to uh, have these 
um, fossiliferous deposits, and then there's stuff that looks like lakes, uh, and then there's other material that's uh, airborne ash, and then there's more layers that suggest a uh, desert, and then there's more layers, and maybe there's fossils in that, and then there's a, 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 a direct lava on top of that. Uh, you've got a layer cake of environments, and the creationist demands that everything be a single, gigantic, relatively rapid sequence of events that they can't ever work out. And that's why reading the creationist literature can be annoying, but also revealing because they can't work this out. And there's always the point where they're suddenly tiptoeing out onto the, the diving board. And not only is the pool empty, but actually there's no diving board there. <laughs> they don't actually have a model. And uh, um, they just fall back on cartoons and badly constructed cartoons. Uh, I was just uh, uh, researching um, uh, some material for uh, the new answers book that uh, Jackson and I are doing. And I discovered an issue where um, uh, well, John Woodmerapp, or no, Ord, uh, um, has these charming little charts where he gives a cartoon for what he thinks is going on to form geologic deposits. But if you look at the details, you realize, wait a minute, uh, vast swaths of water can't cut channels of the kinds that we're seeing. That requires water in an airborne context because the dynamics of, of flow are very, very different. And um, all of that comes about if you have to start thinking through uh, the fine point details and you find out about that by checking the sources. So uh, I, I was pointing out to um, Sai before we uh, started up the program that if you read the higher echelon creationists, they will be chock-a-block with footnotes, huge number of references. Uh, in Jeffrey Tompkins, in Ord, uh, in Snelling, uh, it, they can run on for pages, dozens and dozens, of, uh, maybe even a hundred or more uh, references involved. And uh, it makes it look very intimidating, but narrow it down to claim X on page Y, footnote 32, footnote 32 refers to source X, if that's a direct science paper, try to track it down, especially if you're going, whoa, is that really the case? Uh, that can come about when they've got, uh, when they're making increasingly uh, unsettling claims uh, or uh, uh, the, the meat of their thing. What you want to try to do in analyzing any of these things is finding out what's their big issue, not the trivial details that everyone's um, uh, not disagreeing with, although even there, as Jackson and I have been finding in the biological area, and it's also true in other spots, is that even things that sound not controversial, they may actually be uh, waffling and misunderstanding the primary source data. And you only find that out by looking up the material. If, if the footnote 32 refers to another creationist paper, then you try to track that down and find out what primary sources are in there. There's an awful lot of daisy chaining, incestuous daisy chaining, where um, uh, Ord will cite some more Ord that cites some more Ord that doesn't ever actually establish the points they're trying to make. It's just a rep repetition of the mantras. Uh, that can occur. Um, oh, uh, Immutable Destiny asks, uh, do, you have any, do any creationists get into magnetohydrodynamics regarding star growth and death? Um, you get, oh, I suppose for, for size uh, case, because they brought up magnetohydrodynamics, I better go, my little magnet sound that I do on these <laughs> uh, movie nights. Uh, but uh, I'm not familiar with any right off hand. You've got a fringe group of electric universe people who think that stars aren't actually thermonuclear furnaces, but are like anodes uh, in, a, in, a, in an electric universe. And there's a fringe bunch that pops up um, uh, quite a lot on that. In fact, it looks like it's bumped into this weird conspiracy theorist, climate, anti-climatologist that hacking again has been just citing and I haven't had a chance to research on that. There may be some stuff on um, uh, star growth material, but um, I, I'm not familiar with it right off the bat. Most of the time, it's th they're more obsessed with uh, nucleosynthesis. Uh, the formation of heavy elements in stars. That's a problem that they have got to try to rationalize away because they have to account for why stars have them at all. And some of these things only come about over billions of years of stellar fusion and being thrown out. The reason we as a solar system have them is because you've had um, oodles of stars formed that they're 
byproducts get thrown out in supernovas and new neutron star collisions and other things that can synthesize heavier elements. And we end up getting the debris and that forms as planetary systems around a stellar nebula of that third or fourth generation. So we're one of the newer kids on the block, which means you can't expect aliens to be 8 billion years old because there could be no solar systems with planetary systems around them because the heavy elements needed to make the stuff that formed them hasn't occurred yet. So that has some implications, especially for science fiction stories. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, bum, bum, bum. If I had another person here, we could give a, a secondary look uh, to keep an eye on the, on the live chat. So if I uh, suddenly look over and starts producing horrible dead air, uh, I apologize for that. The dead air thing is something that I, I bother about when I see other people uh, do it. Uh, it's popped up occasionally on Bill Ludlow and even Jackson. Uh, where they're in a chat or looking at the feed and suddenly, mm. what? Ah! Even a couple seconds seems forever in the realm of dead air. And uh, uh, so I try to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, I had to do it just a blip to get over to start up the uh, uh, live chat feed so I could see that because sometimes the, the side material over in the right hand corner of my screen is hard to read at times, so uh, it's easier if I have the live feed in there. So uh, to summarize then, if you want to uh, dive into all that material, uh, the, um, the issues about uh, the geologic system and why particular elements are produced and why not, that's um, a critical factor in modern geology. And always beware when somebody is relying on really old work. That's another feature that's just glaring that um, they're bringing up radiometric dating material from the 1960s and 70s, as if no one's figured that out since and dealt with the implications of it and, and made progress in terms of understanding stuff. And what you find in creationism is they're just basically rehashing the same battles over and over and over again. So because um, argon can leak out of elements, uh, a lot, out of magmas, ergo, all the radiometric dating is wrong. But that doesn't explain Sicker Point in Scotland. It doesn't explain how the Grand Canyon can form, how it can turn into rocks so fast, how it can then be carved out to make a canyon when the kinds of canyons that are formed by catastrophic flooding don't look like the Grand Canyon. They look like the Columbia um, basalt uh, Grand Coulees, steep walls, um, turbulence pools, all that kind of stuff, giant ripple marks. Uh, that's what happens in, in really big natural flooding but they don't look at all that stuff. And we're living in, a, in, a, in such a wonderfully exciting time for the geological material that more of the geology science papers, <laughs> yes, heat shield like the magnet sound, uh, that, um, uh, that there's no excuse for relying on old material. And Lisa brings up, yes, Kent Hovind and his uh, old textbooks. Uh, most of the ones he riffs off of are from basically the time he was probably growing up and getting into the creationism biz. So it would be in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, most of these things aren't even available uh, online anywhere, which shows you how antiquated they are. And um, even if it were the case that they were accurately reflecting the textbook information and that that information has been superseded, it still means that it's been superseded. We learn new stuff. Uh, any geology text prior to 1960 uh, is, gonna have, is gonna be missing plate tectonics. And uh, the same way that uh, uh, in biology, if you're looking at something from the 1980s earlier, they've, they're not gonna be aware of homeobox genes. And that's been revolutionizing our understanding of how developmental processes work, how body plans form, all of that. So it's a matter of, of remembering when things are. Um, another dead giveaway of sloppy scholarship is the undated quote line. Somebody cites scientist X and it's a paragraph or maybe just a sentence and they say from Schmidlap, uh, when? 1880? 1945? Uh, was he uh, on a radio program? Did he write it in a book? Uh, did he do it in a technical article? Uh, without information on that or even if they give a citation. That actually can be a dead giveaway for those of us who like to follow the scholarship. Uh, type the exact reference and Google it. 
and sometimes you can track down what uh, coal mine they're getting it from because the exact the the coal miner has a tendency to be anal retentive because they've never seen the original material so they're afraid to get the reference wrong because they don't know what's relevant to it so they may copy it exactly as it's printed in the coal mine and that can sometimes uh, give information about who, who's copying from who. And in other cases, it's blatantly obvious who's copying from who because the person actually says so. Kent Hovian frequently uh, praises Walt Brown, and that's where he gets a lot of his bad information from, is copying it from good old Walt Brown, which you know, all of his stuff is available online. Um, I can't remember the name of the, uh, the generic uh, website that he does on that. But anyway, you can check him out. Walt, Walter Brown, Walt Brown. And um, he has a, a, an ongoing website. Uh, the stuff gets updated periodically. And um, um, anybody can track around a lot of these things. But there's a, a bunch of techniques that for so source methods you can do to find out about material. You can be Googling phrases. You can be Googling topics. You can be Googling um, uh, names, uh, find out when they lived, if they're older characters, uh, are they active now? Uh, if they're not active now, why not? Uh, and if somebody's putting up an older work, find out what the follow-up has been. Uh, if you discover that, that if it's a technical paper and it hasn't been cited much, well, why? Probably because it's wrong. And so uh, you want to avoid that. Uh, yes, yes, Lisa for Truth, not Walt Brown the poet, uh, just as uh, Mr. Honda is not the car maker. Uh, in the uh, the geology material uh, that we'll work up with. Uh, another thing that really strikes me in my TIP project that I did when I started to keep track of, the, of all the people who are writing the papers, science is really collaborative. It's not a lone wolf thing. There are some scientists who kind of write uh, summary works or particular things just solo, but it's relatively uncommon. The vast majority of science work is collaborative, and so you can have easily, typically five or six authors per paper uh, in, in geology, biology. And then if you get into things like genetic work, holy moly, the list of authors can run a page. Uh, and so the average that I have in my bibliography, I've got like almost 27,000 technical papers and they're written by about 67,000 scientists. And it's averaging out to about 0.4 scientists per uh, paper. In other words, that there are way more scientists than there are involved. You get exactly the opposite when you're talking about um, apologetics. So the average number of, of uh, it's not scientists per paper. In the anti-evolution biz, it's papers per writer. So it's like three or four on average per writer, uh, of order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude higher uh, than uh, what you get in um, uh, the actual science field. Uh, <laughs> oh, we suddenly got a bacon alert there in the, in the field. The, um, the other half of the show, which I'll be getting to in the um, other half, uh, will be something that will make C. Brown either happy or not happy. He's been hectoring me for quite a while, and we're going to be getting at that. Uh, while we're um, in the moment before I get around to a shameless plug, it's another eight or nine minutes before that. Um, I'll give a brief reprise, because Jackson Weed isn't here, of the continuing work that we're doing on The Rocks Were There, where um, we're going to be dismantling on a massive scale um, four of the big Answers in Genesis Answers books that collectively reflect basically the sweep of the creationist worldview. And everything from geology to astrophysics to biology and genetics and the fossil record and the flood and morality and ethics and human origins, it sprawls across a huge amount of, of topics and tramples a massive amount of science material and illustrates with monotonous regularity some of the most incompetent methods that you could ever observe anywhere. Uh, that there's some um, uh, such superficial writing from people who have no business being superficial. Georgia Purdom is not going to like the rocks were there because we've been analyzing for somebody with a genetics background. She really seems bad at this. And it's, it's an astonishing phenomenon. And Andrew Snelling, uh, Woodmer App Ord on geology matters. Um, uh, it's, it's going to be a juicy resource, beautifully researched up to date, uh, filleting, creationists of a wide variety, and not only the, the heavy guns, their answers in Genesis, but the various connecting tropes 
that filter out to in, bump into intelligent design in their arguments about information and uh, uh, various biological processes that they misrepresent. Uh, and uh, a lot of grassroots creationists uh, that um, are doing YouTubes and things now that will be bumping into uh, that side of things. Uh, we'll be giving thumbs up to a lot of the uh, current defenders out there like Bill Ludlow and Pelogia and uh, Trey the Explainer. And there's an awful lot of really wonderful people who are together, hopefully we're building an increasingly cohesive network of information sharing and communication so that we can collectively respond to anti-evolutionists and their ilk in a way that makes life more and more uncomfortable for them in the public arena. Not because we're being insulting, not because we're being nasty to them and being bad to them, but because we're calling them out on their ignorance and we have all the ammunition needed to do that. And uh, uh, because the information is so colossally accessible, uh, I'm always smiling at how many technical papers that, that would have been absolutely unacceptable, un unavailable, um, even just a few years ago, let alone when I was starting out in this gig, when I was starting to research creationism back in the 1980s, yipes, in the era of fax machines and early VCRs. Um, that stuff, unless you had a giant college library to pour through, how would you find out any of that stuff? The internet has made it feasible and search engines has made it able to collectively track down source material at an absolutely unprecedented scale. And this is obviously something that creationists are terrible at, which means from a source methods angle, this is something we want to do well because they can't play this game. And the more we do the source methods gig, the more problems they're in. Um, Yes, Lisa for Truth uh, says Georgia uh, Purdom has tried her hand at geology. Yeah, she's sort of veered into that in some of the apologetics. Uh, she did a terribly funny lecture, uh, which we're alluding to in the book, uh, on um, flood geology. Bill Ludlow, um, I found out about it because Bill Ludlow had done some nice analysis of it. He was actually talking about a different aspect of her speech, but I then went through and um, looked at the whole lecture that she had given. And where she tripped up from my point of view is she made the mistake of talking about some of the biblical kinds and essentially repeating the talking points that the Answers in Genesis has, but glancing past the therapsids, which as you all well know, evolution slam dunk, uh, has covered all of that material in enormous detail and um, available on Amazon. And um, she uh, was giving differing numbers uh, as to like how many uh, dinosaur uh, groups there were that weren't even matching up with some of the numbers that have been given by some creationists. So you have to wonder where is she getting her information from? And there's, there's a remarkable amount of kind of making it up as they go along quality to young earth creationism when they're trying to work out the fiddly bit details. Um, uh, BJ says uh, that um, when she uh, got um, drawn into YEC, I was pretty much told I had to believe it because it's what they believe, a lousy reason. Yeah, it's a lot of top-down uh, apologetics uh, in that area. And, and there, to be fair, there have been um, scientists who have kind of like, this is what the facts are, and believe it or not, you just go ahead and, and take the test. Uh, that's a bad way of doing things. And the most exciting and uh, interesting people in both the popular science era area and the actual science area are ones who say, don't take my word for it. Oh, gosh, you don't need to take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. Check it out. Look it up on your own. Find out what's going on. Uh, and if you find a mistake in what I've been doing, well, let me know because I want to correct it. And so we get um, a big difference between the top-down dogma approach of religious apologetics, of which creationism is a subset of a subset of Christianity. It's not even the majority. The vast majority of religionists don't really get into a lot of these areas because they are perfectly happy with accepting uh, the external science field and the external history field and, and trying to make the most of it. Uh, but source methods and the essence of what it means to do science or history research is a bottom-up approach where you have to establish, well, how do you know that something is there? What does it mean? 
What can you infer from it? What can you surmise about it? Can you test your surmise with new information? Uh, uh, how provisional is it? You don't treat it as something that's established until your uh, tests have borne out that and you see what other researchers can do. It isn't as though anybody in the science field or history field doesn't have um, uh, views and you don't have cliques of people who have differing opinions on things. Uh, you have um, uh, different uh, institutional turf wars that can happen and personality turf wars. Science and history are done by human beings. Of course, they're going to have that just as politics does. But the, the neat and the strength of science is that for the vast majority of them, they're not playing turf wars. They're trying to figure out what actually happened and working out the techniques to do that. Uh, Old Scratch brings up a point that Lisa had been bringing up, define a kind. Yeah, and kind goes anywhere from species to domain. You, that's exactly the problem. And we're having a wonderful section in the New Rocks book uh, on that matter of the um, uh, baromenology, which is the fancy word, I'll put that in the live feed too, baromenology. If you wanna dive into creationism at their trying to be sciencey level, look up baromenology. Barriman analyses, that's done by their uh, heavy guns, uh, Todd Wood, Kurt Wise, uh, Kavanaugh. Uh, there's a, a small smattering. You could literally gather all the barrymanologists into a meeting room at a modest Holiday Inn and have plenty of seats left over. They're not a hell of a lot of them. Uh, but they're trying to work out a creationist systematics. The terrible problem for them is it ain't ever gonna work <laughs> because there weren't created kinds. and for that reason, they're stumbling over the data field at every uh, juncture. Um, one thing is that there are way too many fossils to deal with, and there are way too much genetic information available on existing species, and there are way too many existing species. So they've got multiple problems that they have to kind of reconcile with this truncated scheme, but it's never gonna work. Um, uh, Brian uh, Stevens says, kind is undefined so we can make it whatever we want to fit. And that's kind of how it works out. Um, there's a notion of kind of folk wisdom uh, to um, uh, some of the creationist analysis that we go into. I think Georgia Purdom is one of those who's talking about that. Her foray into systematics is just as bad. Well, uh, we are just past our pl shameless plug time. So if um, Sci Strike will do the honors and please put up uh, my uh, tip patrons so that I may thank all the people. There we go. Thank you so much. Our colleagues, Hendrel and Eric and Suris, our researchers, Travis and Convert Me and Eat Meal and Brad and Ralph and Pelogia and Benjamin Stimson and Ugly German Truths. No, I think they are quite pretty ones. Sur and our assistant researchers, Mike and Duranku and James and Nana, hi Nana, and Puffalophagus and Totes Real and our friends, Daniel and Steve Bauman and Mary Gale and Insects Are Cool, who is in the feed as well, Morton Nielsen and Bo and Staggles and Alex and Paul. And I also mentioned the legacy patrons. These are people who were able to help at various times, but haven't been able to do so on a continuing basis. But believe me, it's all been a, a thing I am grateful for. Uh, Jen and Jody and John and Keith and Andrew and Dyer and Yui and Mona and Daniel and Sun and Everett and Zeshi. And uh, thank you all. Uh, you can go to the next page uh, where it's the matter of the websites. And uh, um, that's tortukanwordpress.com is my website. You can peg it on your smartphone. It's not the easiest thing to access on the smartphone. There's also tortukan.com that has some HTML files that make it a little bit easier to fiddle with. And then uh, you can become a patron for the project uh, and become a name on the aforementioned patron thank list at www.patreon.com downward tip. And uh, there's also a way to donate and do uh, recurring things at gofundme.com dcgo, which I'd set up a couple of years ago when I was just in financial panic level. And uh, there's also at the tortukanwordpress.com, there's links uh, to all the formats of the two books that I have out, both Evolution Slam Dunk and the novel Paralogs of Fog. And uh, that will be joined in due course uh, when I get the uh, next books out, uh, both in the Fog series and the... Uh, uh, rocks were their book and books beyond that, including the one that Jackson and I will be doing after uh, the rocks were there. So thank you all. And now we may return to my far from uh, pleasant mug and uh, resume the second half of the show, which relates to good old C. Brown, our wonderful creationist who has been expressing how 
uh, much he can copy creationist literature and never bother to fact check any of it for quite some time. He was a guest on the show once and he showed that he was a lot like Nephilim. If you're familiar with Nephilim, somebody that really kind of runs on and on with a, a one trick pony dogma and doesn't actually um, answer questions and have dialogue. And so I finally said, bye. Uh, he actually, he left the, the, the show. He got into a hissy fit and departed and I did not let him back. And uh, he's been asking, can I come on to your show and discuss this matter? No. Um, if he wants to discuss it, he can do it in the comments on the video section. Anyway, one of the papers that he was riffing off of is this uh, one by um, uh, Terranova from 2015 on global developmental gene programming invokes, involves a nuclear form of fibrolast growth factor receptor 1 FGFR1. And uh, it's kind of a universal ubiquitous thing uh, that um, uh, involves um, organisms, metazoans. And for this, uh, C. Brown jumps off the gangplank into the empty pool again in insisting that this is uh, impossible to account for from an evolutionary nature. Well, I'm not quite so sure of that. And so there's actually quite a lot of technical information that relates, uh, that the paper in question concluded that the overall importance of such mechanisms in animal development is supported by the evolutionary emergence of nuclear FGFs and FGFR1 in early metazoans. And that relates to uh, some papers by uh, Pop Popovici uh, in um, uh, 2006 and uh, Bertrand et al. in 2009 on uh, FGF signaling systems and how ubiquitous this is and how deep this goes in metazoan evolution. So we put some links up on that, uh, full open access papers. There's actually a ton of material th uh, that's available on fibrolast growth factor and how uh, the scientists are working out bit by bit how this connects up in the evolutionary history and how it's broken off into other areas uh, over time and uh, um, developed in, in manifold usages, which reinforces the idea that core systems mutate over time and take on new functions. Um, <laughs> T.D. Lane says, don't remind us of last week's movie night. Yes, well, um, uh, uh, everybody should subscribe to SciStrike, and if you're able to dive into our actual shows, it's a delightful way of uh, hitting the woo on a monumental scale. And it's basically um, a, a drinking show where occasionally science breaks out, as uh, Sai has described it, because we are discussing uh, stupid stuff, flat earthers, and we've done anti-vaxxers and creationists and a whole w wide range of people who suffer from cranial blockage of the rectum. And um, we go through, it used, the, a, a 15 minute program may take hours to plug through because we're calling drink and proceeding on that. But it, it's um, uh, a delightful stuff because you find out for one thing, uh, there are audiences for a lot of this stupid crap uh, that you find that uh, there are videos by creationists or anti-vaxxers that can have thousands of views, way more than I get here on my low little channel. And you realize that there are people who live off of that woo and it never is going to occur to them to fact check any of it. And they're also very possibly gonna go and vote and who the hell would they vote for and what kind of political impact are these people having in local and state and federal levels. And that may account for one of the reasons why we have some of the people in office that we do. So this is not a trivial issue this uh, methods issue and how people construct arguments and how networks in social communities trade crap around and keep on reinforcing their mythologies over and over and over again and never ever check out whether it's actually true. So um, um, some of the v things have gone quite a long time. We can go till dawn breaks. Uh, and since some of us are all over the place, uh, those shows often have people from Australia and, and Europe and uh, the United States and both coasts. And so it, it's, it's a truly international uh, drinking fest, uh, we have to say. Anyway, uh, Immutable Destiny says, are we talking about C. Brown? Uh, no, no, but Brown, as far as I know, has not done any videos. Um, he's um, um, haunted occasionally in the comments section on things. Um, he actually bought uh, the Rupi and Sanford Contested Bones book because I was criticizing it. So that's a good reason for you all to buy my books 
and uh, tell your libraries about them to act as a counterbalance there so that um, um, some sales come my way as opposed to uh, my lecture actually giving um, Rupi and Samford one more book sales. Um, the, um, uh, the 80 drinks around the world, uh, uh, to Lane, uh, TD Lane says. Anyway, um, uh, so C. Brown, uh, I'm throwing down a gauntlet that there is in fact a technical evolutionary literature on uh, fibrolast growth factor. Um, by all means, write your monograph and communicate with the scientists, communicate with the scientists in the Terra Nova paper and tell them why the evolutionary emergence of nuclear uh, FGFs in early metazoans doesn't mean what they clearly said it did in their own technical paper. You've got uh, Bertrand and Popovici and all the various scientists involved in that end of things. Um, let them know how brilliant you are and how you know their science way better than they do without actually having to go to school or read any of their papers. And, uh, oh, thank you, T.D. Lane, uh, that uh, uh, Evolution Slam Dunk is a planned holiday purchase. Yes, we're hoping to get uh, the two new books out for the holiday season as well. And um, it's um, uh, going to be a corker. Uh, we're very, very proud of the research that they've done on that together. And um, if uh, Jackson uh, shows up uh, during the remainder of the show, uh, getting off of work, uh, I will be happy to remind everyone of that as well. Um, the um, uh, uh, submitting for peer review that BJ brings up is a, um, a fascinating side issue because creationists think they do peer review too. And what it involves uh, uh, for their technical journals, you've got the Answers Research Journal, uh, there's the old Journal of Creation that um, is under various names. They've, they've a lot of ones knocking around there. There's not much in the way of intelligent design journals. Biocomplexity is kind of the only one at the moment. And they have air quotes peer review uh, for those where they have fellow believers who vet the material. And they do semi-seriously vet it in the sense that they make sure that their arguments are being documented in um, what they think is adequate level. And this, of course, does not necessarily mean that it is adequate to prove their case. And that's where you find that out by reading the source data and ferreting out what the primary source material is, because some of them can be remarkably obtuse. Um, there was a, a case that uh, Jackson and I are going into in the new book uh, where um, uh, Richard, um, oh gosh, it's, uh, Bugs, Richard Bugs, who is a, not necessarily an intelligent design advocate directly yet, uh, but anyway, he co-authored um, a paper that was in a regular science journal, um, or, or regular science anthology, I should say, um, on um, the orphan gene problem which isn't so much of a problem today as it was seen. These are, are genes that don't seem to have a, uh, an immediate homologue in other genes. And therefore the creationist jumps in and goes, aha, that's because they were deliberately designed and they don't have any antecedents. It turns out to be way more complex than that. And the, the, the shell games that were going on, Nelson, I expect him to do it. He's a young earth creationist, even though he's labeled as an intelligent designer, but, but bugs ought to know better in some of the evasions and tap dancing that he's gone into in this area. So given that the, the nature of the method that I can see in their analysis, it wouldn't surprise me if he eventually ends up, he's apparently quite religious, uh, that, um, he, that he may very well end up in the intelligent design orbit more officially as time progresses, but we'll find out about that. Uh, uh, the idiot says biocomplexity, literally living proof that bio-level complexity can be built from scratch by a mindless organic chemistry given the right precursor chemical conditions. Indeed, the, um, the, the, the neat thing about it is that there's so much to learn, but an awful lot has in fact been learned. And uh, what the fibrolast growth factor does as an example is indicate the actual science data field that needs to be accounted for. How you can look at how these particular genetic systems um, and the proteins that are involved in them are actively being used by varying organisms, which allows you to see how the switchings have taken place and additions that have modified the molecules and those take on new functions over time and those produce new interactions and variables. 
Uh, you can find that out by reading the papers. And for all the time he's been waving that argument, it apparently never dawned on him to read the content and check the sources. That's how he could have found out about the Bertrand paper directly, because it's one of the ones cited in the paper he was waving at me. And the fact that it literally didn't occur to him to do that level of filling in the blanks and figuring out what the data field is, because regardless of whether you like evolution or not, the data is still there. You've got to account for the data. You need to, if you want to believe that everything in the genetic field in our human species was present in Noah and the kids and ultimately in Adam and Eve, only 6,000 years old ago, then fine, go ahead and make that argument. But you need to account for why the haplotypes are the way they are and how long it would take to do that and whether there's any sign from the DNA that we now have from archaic humans that don't match up with the kind of genetic deterioration notions that you find knocking around when Jensen and Tompkins and Sanford with his genetic entropy. And so I say, go ahead, try to make your case, but you have to account for the data. Uh, Mutable Destiny says, do creationists try to predict how long after the flood it would take for some new gene to arise in a species? Uh, they don't really acknowledge that there can be new genes because if they do that, they've opened the floodgate to what was the original created form. And so you get these buzzwords about created heterozygosity, which um, Samford has used and which pops up a lot in Standing for Truth. If you've seen the debates that uh, I and Jackson Weed have done and he pops around in, in these modern uh, day um, uh, hysteria debates uh, as well and in the live feed commentary area. But um, in principle, uh, the moment they start arguing that in a short frame of time, a genuine new gene can evolve naturally, they've got a problem because it certainly doesn't rule out genes evolving slowly. And indeed, if you can demonstrate that the slower approach actually makes sense biologically and the super fast approach wouldn't make sense. So by and large, they just don't deal with most of the genes. And um, the... Um, do, 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 do. Uh, um, the idiot says he heard one joker try to use some rapid mutation of Indian Tasmanian devils as evidence that post-flood hyper-evolution is totally plausible. Uh, maybe he was watching the, the cartoon plas Tasmanian devil rather than the technical papers on that, you know, the little uh, the super spinny one that uh, devours mountains and all that kind of stuff that I grew up on. Uh, uh, but um, the difficulty is not only the genetic information, but then you have that dreaded biogeography of why certain genes are showing up in certain taxa and those taxa are seen in certain places of the earth, but not elsewhere. And it's, it's, a, it's an impossible mess for them to try to account for with the double bottleneck of the creation at 6,000 years old. Remember, it's not just Adam and Eve, it's every single thing on the planet would have to be that. And then there's a bottleneck where whatever created diversity may have originated all the stuff that took place before the flood, then that gets fixed as the kinds that are on, on, brought on board. And then that has to generate everything since. And um, to try to figure out how speciation could occur so quickly and why we don't see any signs of that biologically. Uh, everything about looking at living species suggests that you can have some kinds of isolation fairly quickly things that especially don't really involve big shifts in genes. Uh, an insect that starts breeding um, a little bit later in the day, and therefore temporal cues can get shifted over, but all their biology is the same. Um, T.D. Lane, the sphere, by the way, uh, uh, how's the shrubbery? Ah, oh, yes, yes, we wish to have a shrubbery. Uh, I'm going into the knights who say me. <laughs> um, Yes, Immutable points out that there's diversity to consider within the transcriptome, the proteome, and the glycome. Yeah, you've got one of the hardest things uh, for evolution defenders to get a grip on, as let alone the creationists, is to remember all the levels that are going on simultaneously. As you think about individual organisms that have a sea of churning biology that's going on as as DNA is being transcribed and proteins are being assembled and then whatever is left over it, it isn't being used 
are being uh, recycled and all of this is happening at, at enormous speed inside of every single cell in your body. And you are an individual in a population of organisms that potentially can breed and that's part of the gene flow within that population. And there are terms, deems and avatars and others that refer to the subcategories on that. And then those populations of organisms can vary geographically and they have predator prey interactions, which we humans have been kind of keeping down by getting rid of the wolves and trying to combat the organisms that attack us. But normal organisms don't have the advantage of science and medicine to be able to do that. So they're living in a natural population. And the predator prey relationships, those are taking place in an ecology that's formed from all of the organisms plus the physical relationships of rivers coming down and storms coming in and all the things that can happen there. And that on a bigger scale is being affected by the wobbling of the Earth's axis and the shifting of plates. Well, geez, try to figure all of that out at the same time. Um, <laughs> oh, Puffalobica says, sorry, I'm so late. Uh, uh, 13 credit hours this semester plus hour commute each way to and from school. Uh, make no apologies about doing your education, Puff. Uh, that, um, that's one of the advantages of having a feed that goes on to posting so that anybody can watch it anytime. And uh, I make the point that everything that I say, I say for attribution. And I expect people to not take my word for it, to check stuff out. I hope I spur their curiosity to do so. They may find out wonderful information I don't know about. Well, let me know. If you're on Twitter, tweet me up. Um, if you uh, uh, send a message, you can put it up on the videos. I get uh, feeds of any comments uh, on uh, Chrome about uh, comments on any of the videos. And uh, I've even um, made answers to those when I've been on the fly over to visit relatives. I'll get a message on that on my smartphone and I will comment on that. Well, pro information that pops in, uh, I call attention to as well. I've been trying to build up a network of scientists that I've researched and studied. Uh, and any of those that are on Twitter, I try to follow them because they tend to give people heads up about their work. And that speeds up the process of getting into a lot of different areas that gives you heads up on cutting edge research, research that um, you wouldn't necessarily know just by hitting the public news media. And so I, I want to keep ahead of the game and I want all of the opponents of creationism collectively to be able to stay ahead of the game, not play catch up. So the more you can do things where a creationist is repeating an old claim, well, you know all about the old claim and you can drop the boom on them right away and know just the right question to ask to trip them up and to force them onto that source defense turf that we know they can't play. So, um, um, oh, uh, Reese asked, do I follow Dr. Hovind? Uh, I can, but it's useless. Um, Hovind never responds to things. And um, I can't recall whether or not Kent has actually blocked me now. Ken Ham did. He, all, a lot of these major young earth creationists have Twitter feeds and sometimes they just block people that get in the way. Their organizations tend not to. So Answers in Genesis and others, the Discovery Institute, uh, some of those will do things. Ironically, the intelligent design people are much less prone to that. And they have kind of a button down collegiate mentality that makes them a little bit uh, more congenial than the preacher oriented types like the Kent Hovins and the Kent Hams. Eric Hovind is a brick wall. Uh, he puts out occasional postings, puffing up the work that they do in the videos that he's doing, but he never responds to anything. Uh, Kent Hovind has occasionally. And Eric never does debates, as opposed to his uh, dad, who um, debates some people at the drop of a hat. Uh, he debated me once, and I'm not entirely expecting him to ever want to debate me ever again. Uh, and uh, that's ideally the situation that should prevail uh, for a source methods approach, which is it's a game they can't play, and they're going to hit the buzzsaw, and they're never going to want to have it again. And so um, the more people who do um, source methods, uh, the more opportunities you have to make life miserable for creationists and to shut them down. So um, let's see, where are we? Ooh, 5.54. Uh, so we're uh, coming along, uh, nearing the end of the hour. Um, so the two issues that are on the plate that from this program today is the continuing point that 
all the information that they've found from geochronology on rare earth gases and gases in general, helium and hydrogen and all these other things, the isotope balances that they find in rocks are clues to the geochemistry of what goes on deep in the planet. And the people doing the work in this area and making sense of it aren't the creationists. They've contributed diddly squat to this field. And all they can do is to write papers that are intended for fellow creationists to repeat. And uh, that's, uh, oh, uh, Jackson um, uh, wants uh, his back home now. And we will have to give him a link to what the heck is going on. Actually, uh, Cy, uh, contact uh, Jackson and let him come into the program here. We can run a little bit over to catch up on that material because uh, Jackson is always enormously informative and uh, uh, I am constantly stimulated by his intellect and research and vice versa, hopefully, uh, that um, uh, I have background in a history sense, very long awareness of a long bunch of creationists, but he's a young guy who's just um, getting into the field and, and he has the advantage in many respects of being at the college level, um, whereas I was in the college department back before he was born. So I've had to catch up on the cutting fields. When you hit college, you start bumping into all the science you didn't get in high school. And it's the same thing happened in history, that the, the history that I learned in high school, I had some brilliant history teachers, but boy, you suddenly find out what the current historiography is on the Civil War and, and uh, other fields uh, the moment you get into the college level. Hi, Jackson, glad you were able to make it. Fashionably late. Yeah, fashionably late, yeah. I had told them that we are uh, continuing our dissection. Georgia Purdom came up in the live chat and, and uh, we were talking about how she the ventures- Georgia into, Purdom? Yeah, the Georgia Purdom that how she manages to venture into fields she shouldn't, uh, geology and systematics, and that I pointed out she also manages to blunder in genetics, and how the hell does she justify that given her uh, potential expertise, because she's published. Yeah, it's a, uh, she's, she did like a, some cancer research uh, years back. Yeah, uh, that's another thing you find out. It isn't, um, now, of course, creationist grump that the reason why they don't do much now is because they're being banned from the collegiate environment. No, that ain't true. Uh, that you still find creationists, if they do just technical work, they still get published. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, oh yeah, nothing. Whitmore did, John Whitmore. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they're still, so long as they don't try to foist their unjustified creationist arguments, they can still do the data. And this is ultimately their Achilles heel because they're presenting material that is a data field that is acceptable um, at a regular scientific level. And they need to account for it too, not just the evolutionists, the creationists need to. And so there was that um, wonderful lecture that Kurt Wise gave on uh, the flood that has been lobbed at me by several different creationists. And we'll, uh, as you know, we're including this in the new uh, Rocks book. But along the way, he um, made the mistake of talking about these paleo currents that um, uh, Chadwick and others and Whitmore had uh, uh, come up with claiming that they actually can detect the waters coming in all going in one direction in, in the, on the planet because of the way the flood's working and then the receding of the water is the opposite direction and that they can detect this in the geology. And the only problem is, is they made the data set available in a regular nature publication. And so anybody can check it out and they, and you can see just how cherry picky Chadwick and company were when they tried to make these little charts and Wise apparently never thought to investigate that. Oh, surprise, surprise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Color me it's, shocked. Um, there was a brand new blip that I've just been diving into. One thing leads to another, uh, Jackson, I tell you this, uh, it, it, as doors open up, uh, but there was um, a, a material uh, on um, uh, Guy Bertolt, who is a French creationist who has tried to do these sedimentation experiments. And I was mentioning it's a side strike before the show began, that um, he's the darling of the young earth creationists. They rely on him enormously. And there's a small band of creationists. There's some in Russia, uh, Lamalov and others who are um, uh, Lalalov, Lalalov, whatever, uh, in... Um, 
uh, that follow in his little orbit. And they made the mistake of publishing a bit too much because there was a data set they were coming up with on this particular um, Russian deposit that uh, Lalamalov uh, had written in the early 2000s and it's available online. And then um, later on that same data set gets revamped as a new paper in 2017 in which Bertold and a couple other of his creationists by these are directly co-authors. And I suddenly realized I, the, the tables were the same data field, except their summation numbers are different in the two versions. <laughs> That's right, yeah, I remember that. And, and the summation version in the first version, the one that Bertolt wasn't involved in um, directly, do add up, but you can't figure out how they arrive at the, the numbers they do. They're all arguing that these are like four to 6,000 years ago for these supposed deposits. Uh, to form them. And it, it, it produces an awful lot of sediments uh, all at once per day that's, you wonder, yeah, is that really feasible? Anyway, uh, the second version, the 2017 one, not only has the different numbers, but they don't add up to their, their totals, that they've supplied completely different numbers that differ from in the original material on the same data set, and that they don't even add up to the, to the total numbers. So I, I decided to mention the fact that, you know, the old too many cooks spoil a broth, and in this case, too many creationists spoil the math. <laughs> yeah, it does, uh, it does seem like that, of course. They're, I mean, their entire chronology is off by orders of magnitude, so yeah. I shouldn't be too surprised. <laughs> yeah, and all you have to do online when you're dealing with, with creationists interactively is uh, um, say, okay, the flood is 2350 BC-ish. Let's drop down in the time machine. Let's get into the mental way back to say Halloween, October 31st, uh, 2350 BC. Has the flood started yet? If so, what are we seeing? How long is it gonna last? What do we see later? Put your chronology down. Tell us what's going on here and 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 here, including what's under your own feet. And the more geological examples you look at, don't go dragging us off to the Grand Canyon. Uh, it, you should be able to fly, find examples of this everywhere. And you do find people like John Woodmerap and Ord, Michael Ord, uh, they do try to tackle a lot of geological places, but it's the same bad argument applied like a, a standard coat to everything that they repeat, where they'll just say, oh, this is flood. Um, really? And then you look, and then you can start investigating what sources they're drawing on and whether or not their sources are data or being misrepresented. And you find that over and over and over again. And we're having such fun <laughs> researching all of this for the new book, because uh, I think uh, we're probably delving deeper at the source level on more topics than's ever been tackled before regarding answers in Genesis. I definitely think that that is true. Yeah, it's, um, there's been a lot of wonderful criticism over the years, but then there have been just delicious minefields of stupid that, that people haven't investigated before in part because of the unavailability of the so sources. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, Puffalophagus, I brought up the ice dome idea and my HVAC instructor said the melting of that would impart so much latent heat that it would have uh, boiled the planet. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's that thermodynamic issue. Well, even to hold it, it up. Yeah, yeah, even though, well, yeah, and the, the, uh, the ice canopy thing is one that was such a bad idea back when I was young. I had a, a high school physics teacher who tossed it out. He stopped right in the middle of a lecture one day and started talking about this ice canopy theory. And I recognized years later that uh, he was either a young earth creationist or somebody who was flirting with that perspective. He never dogmatized about it and he didn't preach any time then on. It was just this one interlude that stood out. And so I was aware of the ice canopy idea uh, from the 60s on and it has gone absolutely nowhere in, in young earth creationism, even the vapor canopy idea. Um, has been just debunked for all the same reasons that you just can't figure out what it does and how it works. Anything yeah. to make this like this super duper greenhouse thing generates way too much heat. It's it's a problem. But yet somebody that gullibly still tosses that off is Kent Hovind. And he parasitically calls it the Hovind theory. Like he came up with it all on his own, 
No, Hovind hasn't come up with a damn thing on his own. He's a well, secondary parasite. He came up with his own credentials, so after that, everything was easy. That, that is true. Yeah, that that <laughs> is true. Yes. I, um, uh, you know, he, RJ, when I get my uh, when I get my bachelor's in a year and a half, uh, which will be my first degree, I will then have one more degree than Ken Hovind. Yeah, yeah. I, well, and technically speaking, because I have an actual BA in history, I'm one up on him too. Even there you if, go. <laughs> Although I think he manages the BS even without a bachelor's of science. So uh, true. Very and we, we can't really talk too much about it because it was not for open display. But I will agree that we had one of the most delicious conversations with an active science researcher in the uh, biogenesis field uh, yeah. that was just gobsmackingly exciting. Oh, yeah, we it was. Killed more, we killed like three hours in that we did we could have talked way more probably <laughs> yeah um, and um uh, uh you can tell us whatever information that, that is publicly sayable about it or not oh uh, so i have to be super duper vague about it oh i mean i yeah um i mean he was just telling us about his research work in protein evolution which is all very fascinating um and it was neat so um, yeah, it was a very good talk. Hey, he gave me a lot of advice, a lot of I advice. Um, I was telling I was telling Cy Strike that he gave you some of the most amazing insights as to career moves and how to deal with them, and to find the area of excitement that you want to do in a, a, ideally in a topic that hasn't been covered by anybody else. Yeah, and, and I was um, I was actually thinking about that um, yesterday, and. I, I've kind of been, I was thinking uh, at the time when we were talking to him about animals uh, in particular, but I think multicellularity or the origin of multicellularity as a whole is a very fascinating topic and yeah. something I've kind of been thinking about. So we'll see. Yeah, that that's an area. Um, uh, contact Michael Heron. Uh, you know did. how much that, that, there's, a, there's an opening right in there uh, uh, because of that Volvox issue that there are elements of multicellularity origins that are amenable. Uh, oh, oh, look at the new Loki bacteria. Uh, that's that's a potentially interesting area to dive into because there there is cutting edge up, up the yeah. Um, there are some. I mean, life as well. I think one of the hallmarks of evolution is that life tries out everything. Is that you see a gradient of different paths rather than the same thing over and over again even in convergent examples you see different ways to attack the same issue and so yeah. the fact that we have you know uh there's multicellularity in the green plants and also a number of algae and also brown algae and the the red algae and um various protist groups you know, fungi yeah, he, animals uh, simon conway morris is is an exemplar of somebody that has uh, making a very good case for the idea that given billions of years, multiple paths to multicellularity means that multicellularity is kind of inevitable uh, Probably, yeah. in biological systems. The other intriguing thing that I was delighted uh, that our, our views are, were tracking in the same direction as the fellow we were chatting with is that he agreed that it was exceedingly likely that in the period between the very first replicators and the last universal common ancestor, Luca, there was a lot going on that we can't see in extant organisms because of all of those also rands that had their play on the stage but eventually got outcompeted by the thing that eventually ends up as Luca. Yeah, yeah, that was a, um, it was, it was very fascinating. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't blame him for not wanting to uh, to go on camera. Uh, yeah. He didn't I know us from Adam, uh, and and that's under. But I I was just so blown away by his his friendliness, his openness, and his enthusiasm. Absolutely, yeah. That boy, yeah. you know, that if there's any anybody that you can imagine being the teacher that you would be just killing to get into the class every day, that would be one of them. Probably, yeah, yeah. He's uh, came across very. A very neat person. He was a very neat person. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the I would definitely want to talk with him again. I hope maybe 
at some point on camera, he'd be interested in doing on camera. Well, what he could do is is say now that he's taken the plunge, um, have uh, say would it be possible for him to discuss uh, in a, in an actual video feed uh, when his next paper comes out? Sure. To discuss yeah. that content because I think that would be absolutely delightful because the work that he's been doing is just delicious. It's fundamental it's cutting edge and you know it's such a contrast after after um all of the the claptrap creationism that we've been knee deep in in working on the answers book to compare that to that bright effervescent mass of knowledge and interconnectivity that you see with the scientists that we cannot name uh <laughs> um it, it, it was just like night and day yeah yeah it's um i guess that you know, it's just kind of how it is. You have the creationists who are just kind of bumping around in their own little incestuous groups yeah. versus the researchers who are doing insane, you know, amazing work. Yeah. And, they're, and you're right, they're connecting up uh, all across the globe. He's, he's what, in Israel, and he said he was doing, uh, talking about guys in Japan who were uh, doing this research also. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. There was also a delicious lecture yesterday uh, from Olivia Judson on, uh, um, she had, she had written a paper um, in 2017 on like the five stages of the big things in evolution. And oh. uh, uh, it, um, it's available open access. So everybody can hunt it up on that. She's also written the book that if you haven't read this book, uh, uh, Dr. Tatiana's uh, Advice to All Creation, on the, on the sex lives of animals that she was talked into doing it. And she said, but I can't be funny. Well, boy, did she demonstrate she can be funny. And, and it's one of the most exhilarating, humorous, but scientifically accurate reads that, that if you just need a wonderful science book that will just get you roaring because of it's talking about the weird sex lives of animals as if these animals are writing to a sex advice columnist. Mm -hmm. And it, it's an absolute delight. Uh, uh, next, a, after you get Evolution Slam Dunk, get Sister Tatiana's book by uh, Olivia Judson. But anyway, uh, it was a wonderful lecture. And what what I was saddened about it is how few questions she got. That that this should have been a, a much more in, interestingly thought provoking field. And in fact, uh, in all of my lecturing that limited that I've done, I feel uh, down if I'm not getting a lot of feedback and uh, spurring on it. Sometimes it's a case, uh, because I, I treat that as kind of theater, that I want to kind of spur it. So if there isn't questions, I can maybe prod the audience in a way, and then somebody will get over their reluctance and raise the hand, and then you get the ball rolling. And I found that usually once you get that thing going, the other matter that, that's a difference in the way that the, the standard lecturers operate in the way I've done in mine, is I like to get down and dirty. I don't like to stand up as the character on the stage away from everybody. I prefer to have a handheld microphone and I can get down into the audience and interact facially, visually. You're seeing them right directly and you have a little mini audience around you and work that way and basically work the field. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's my particular approach on all that. Um, this uh, uh, BJ says, could be so new to someone they don't know the questions to ask yet. That's also a possibility. Uh, Reese asked, how many dinosaurs were decapitated when the asteroid hit? That's an interesting question. Oh, my of, goodness. Of, of how many dinosaurs there were, what the population of the planet I, was. Uh, I, and, uh, I cannot believe that um, what's his name asked that question. Um, the kid. Um, what's his name? Powell. Matt Powell. Oh, Matt Powell. Yes. Yeah. The, the, he uh, was the, the one the homophobic who said, jerk. Yeah. He said, how how many dinosaurs were decapitated by the asteroid? I thought I didn't think up to this point. I thought I'd heard a lot of of claims. <laughs> I didn't think anyone ever actually thought that. I thought they at least understand it hit the Earth, right? <laughs> it, no, it just passed by, decapitated the dinosaurs, and went off. Uh, yeah, like a big scythe or something. Uh, just, and, and well, no one's ever going to accuse Matt Powell of understanding much. <laughs> so it's not, it's not that difficult for him to be confused on this matter. I mean, he's a hovindista. I mean, what can you expect? 
uh, he, he was, he'd be trawling authority quotes and, and never bothering to fact check them. Uh, T.D. Lane says uh, he, that he didn't know the asteroid was Robespierre. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a fair point. But I just, I can't believe he, I, I guess, in, you know, in one sense, it makes sense because he is not concerned enough with being right about science that he's going to ever actually ask anyone. He doesn't yeah. care that much. This is, this is just show for him. He thinks this is, you know, you've got the theology and you've got the Bible and then science is kind of nice, but it's off to the side. Um, it's another thing that should support us. Right. Well, I, because he thinks that way, he doesn't care really about the things he's saying. He doesn't care. Uh, you know, he doesn't fact check. Um, the quotes that he mines no uh, as we know yeah he, he even that. when even when we called attention to the original material you explicitly pointed out to him that he had the thing wrong mm -hmm. with uh oh uh, uh, what was it colbert or uh, uh, it was carol 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 yeah uh carol's uh, old uh, paleontology book that was available online full text and even then he just doesn't address it it just bounces off of his little mind shell and he goes on with the same claptrap yeah, it, um, well, he's he's a hovendista, you know. Uh, yeah, actually, it's funny. Set, I mean, it's funny that we that we mention him because I haven't heard from him in months. I haven't heard anything from him. Few who yeah. have like their little flash in the pan moment, and then maybe they get a life. Uh, given the virulence of his views, I suspect he hasn't gone away completely. Well, I'm still wondering what hell in the hell happened to Casey Luskin. What the I mean, hell he's fallen off the map. That that is true. It's ironic because uh, Powell dropped a video where he interviewed Hovind and uh, Stephen Anderson and a bunch of other people, and he you know he dropped the video, and then he was gone. You know, you think you get the opposite effect, but nobody watched it, so mm. so nobody yeah. remembers him. He just kind of fell off the map. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, whether or not, uh, uh, however many people see or not see what I do, um, I intend that whatever I say and do is for attribution permanently and that I'm proud of what I do and say and have reasons for it and can defend anything that I say and do and I'm happy to say, don't take my word for it. Don't take Jackson's word for it. Check it out and uh, find out what's going on here. Uh, oh, oh, Reese's, but what about the Civil War soldiers that shot down the pterodactyl? I seen a picture, Matt showed it. <laughs> uh, I, that, that one was making the rounds, um, especially just a few years ago where somebody had Photoshopped uh, a pterodactyl into a Civil War photograph and was claiming that somebody in the Civil War had actually shot down a pterosaur. But you still find the very current issue of acts and facts from the Institute for Creation Research is still trying to field some of this cryptozoology stuff. Uh, they're, they're suddenly pointing to uh, some tapestries from medieval France that they're claiming show dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, oh, um, there's a picture. I mean, it's obviously... Photoshop, but it's a T Rex and it's in World War II, and the T Rex has a machine gun and the cap. <laughs> the yes, yes, T Rex know, giving his life for his they country. Were, they they were a, they were the hidden secret of fighting during the uh, the uh, Second World War. Actually, the um, oh, and um, uh, what about uh, Mokeli Mabimbi? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. After what I mean, like a century at least of people looking in the same general area, no one's found anything. Yeah, yeah, and remember, this is not the era of of Tarzan of the Apes, the, the nineteen ten, when so much of the area was uncertain. Bloody hell, they've got cell phones in Africa now. We have satellite communications. We have documentarians going through things all the time. We have people photographing crap. That the idea that there could be a population and there would need to be a population of of brontosaurs traipsing around in some pool somewhere. Apparently they seem to think that, that Africa has way more lakes than it actually does. That it's, it, there's uh, um, like, it, it, I was surprised when I did my research for the new Fog novel that the part of it set in South Africa, how few lakes there are in South Africa. Well, a lot that of it is some, the desert. There are some nat uh, unnatural ones that have been built up from dams and mm -hmm. then there's just a few things and they have very uncertain bits and they're seasonal lakes, you know, they pop up when the rains happen and there's a lake there and then they disappear. Right. Uh, but but the, uh, the idea that you could have these population of brontosaurs, A, they don't live in water to begin with. They're not, <laughs> this was the old 1930s image of a brontosaur. This is not how we understand right. our I mean, The, um, 
Yeah, they're they're found they're from uh lacustrine and alluvial deposits. You know, Ooh, you're using that word that Kent Hovian didn't like. Lacustrine. <laughs> lacustrine. Yeah, they live in environments that have lakes, but they themselves did not live in the lakes. <laughs> oh, Elisa asked, Kent thinks the uh, Makalabembe is real? Yeah. Of course he does. Uh, that, th negative. there is a, this is a thing that goes on. It's, it's sort of like any old port in a storm that because there had to have been, th th they don't argue dinosaurs didn't exist. So they must have been on the ark because all the animal kinds were on the ark. Ergo, they had to have come off the ark afterwards ergo where are they now so there's a natural impetus they can accommodate a certain amount of everything dropping dead conveniently but it would make a better argument since it's only 4500 years ago that there should be remnant populations of these critters and so they, they they're grasping at straws so there's a natural tendency among young earth creationism to suck up the cryptozoology gang that therefore connects them up with another network of increasingly credulous ones that finally bump into ancient super civilizations in Atlantis and space aliens and a whole bunch of other stuff. So there, there's always the risk of them uh, starting to slide into uh, theological heresy if they're not careful about it. And uh, it's a fun operation to watch, but uh, that stuff constantly occurs and will occur independent of any corroborating evidence. Look at the number of people that still point to that rock formation in Turkey as the Ark. <laughs> well, um, we're, uh, we did spoil a little bit past the hour. We were great to have Jackson here. He has a life to deal with as well. I think we've covered all the material on here and we will be uh, dealing with things next week. If Cy wants to pick my um, uh, black end blurb up and we can say goodbye to everybody and uh, uh, cut the show down for the day again. Thank you all. Behold and partake of tip and uh, see you next week, gang.